Well, welcome everybody. We're delighted to have our last presentation here of the season of our Sunday afternoon with program. We've had a, a wonderful variety this year. Everybody from the volunteer fire department at Kamshi. Uh, presented back last April to the early innkeepers, all about music and dance, architecture, the community of uh, Kampshi when it was invaded by the hippies, <laughs> and uh, uh, just a wonderful, wonderful variety. And this year to wrap things up, we're, we're thrilled to have our presenter, Michael White, who is the author of um, Shipwrecks of the California Coast, Wood to Iron, Sail to Steam. <laughs> and uh, we have his book, and it's a very fascinating account of over 2,000 shipwrecks along the coast uh, since very early days, and um, what happened to them, and salvage efforts, who was involved, I'll let him go on about that. But um, to tell you a little bit about Michael, he is a California native and has written four books, is working on another book, and he is a maritime historian. So uh, we feel very honored to have him here. And uh, thank you, Michael. I, without further ado, let's welcome Michael. <laughs> It's an honor to be. I hope the I hope the floor holds. Wow. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I drove up from oh, I flew into Oakland and then drove. And I I've been a lot of places in my life, but I I really think that this is among the most beautiful places I've ever seen in my life. It's just absolutely gorgeous. And I I commend you and hope you're good caretakers, good stewards of what you've been blessed with here. It's a beautiful, beautiful place. But I just wanted to share with you a couple of things, not only based on the book that just disappeared, but <laughs> I'm working on another book, um, the likes of which I haven't seen around. It's, it's actually, it's called California Maritime. It's going to be, hopefully, will be out the end of next year, and it's a, co a compilation of just California Maritime events, stories of ship, shipwrecks, near catastrophes, little episodes and whatnot that I that I research by going to the original sources online and in libraries and whatnot that I could not use in this book because the book is by its very name limited to shipwrecks. But I wanted to kind of meld the two today and maybe show you some things and maybe we can learn some things that you weren't aware of before. With the admission of course of probably in this room is is uh, the collective knowledge about matters maritime, particularly of the Redwood Coast, times 10 of what I know. You live here, you're, you're marinated in it every day, and I, I really do salute what the people here at the Kelly House do. And I had the honor to meet the granddaughter of a captain of one of the ships that, I, as a matter of fact, I just wrote about it, uh, the Watson A. West, which was a four-masted schooner that was wrecked on San Miguel Island back at the turn of the last century. And she's with us today. The California coastline uh, stretches for about 800 miles from Crescent City to San Diego if you draw a straight line. But if you get a string and you kind of all the inlets, all the bays, all the harbors, all the everything, and then stretch the line taut, the coastline would stretch for over 2,400 miles. It's the, the third longest coastline in the country after Hawaii and Alaska. And a coastline that long has a lot of stories going along with it, particularly stories of the ships that sailed that coastline, the men who manned them and women who manned them, the passengers that were aboard them, that depended upon them for the type of transportation that I did this morning in about an hour from, from Burbank to, to Oakland that would take many more hours than that and sometimes uh, proved to be a lot more fatal. And the cargoes here as well. But it doesn't take long, uh, then it doesn't take too much rather to conclude that the economy and the social history of California is very, very dependent upon the maritime history of the state. And people have asked me, where did you get your interest in California maritime history or maritime history in general? My dad and my mom are from New England. 
And my dad, I can remember my dad regaling me with stories of as a, as a boy going down to the shores of Narragansett Bay watching the old Fall River Line steamers heading out on their way to New York. And he told me that uh, in that, his house in Fall River, the street in front, and there's a famous photograph across the river from his house of a tanker lifted up during the hurricane of 1939 and deposited on the street in front of his house. Just incredible, incredible things. So I got that from my dad. Another thing I got from my dad, who was a bartender of 42 years, is actually two bits of advice that he gave me. Number one, never put ketchup on a hot dog. Don't ever do that. He said that under any circumstances. If somebody puts a gun to your head, don't ever put ketchup on a hot dog. And number two, everybody has a story, and he heard a lot of them in 42 years of being in the bar. But I don't think he would mind much if I extrapolated and said that not, not only everybody has a story, but everything and every place has a story. And California has a story, despite what people at East and Rockies think. California does have a history, and a large part of it is maritime history, and a large part of that history is not only above the water, it's underneath the water as well. So, just wanted to share a few things with you today about that. San Francisco, in the, the latter part, or the middle, from the middle of the 19th century to the beginning of the 20th century, was the preeminent port in the state of California, actually on the, on the west coast of North America. It saw an influx of ships from all over the world during their heyday, and her docks brimmed with cargo from, manufa from manufactured goods and agricultural products to coal and railroad iron, iron moving to and from Europe, Australia, Asia, and Latin America. The port dominated the movement of trade for decades. After the turn of the century, though, the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach came into the fore. Oh, oh come on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm up here alone and you're in like, Now, I, we have to tell you that this, did, does any, did anybody have one of these at home? Yeah. Like a big, huge, massive, enormous screen? Yeah. Okay. Somehow this thing is reading the pictures out of order, okay? Yeah. And I can only blame... The machine. Yourself. The machine. <laughs> blame myself. Okay, I'll blame myself. But anyway, this is the Port of L.A. around, around 1906. Uh, as you can see, steamers and schooners lined up. This part of it is what is now Terminal Island. Mm -hmm. The Port of L.A. and the Port of Long Beach are now the numbers one and two ports in the entire United States. They handle more cargo than any other ports. Oakland is number five. San Francisco, for a variety of reasons, by 1920 was, was basically overshadowed by Los Angeles and Long Beach. By 1906, San Pedro, which became the port of LA in 1909, was the number one lumber port in the world, in the entire world. And that's lumber coming from this area and moving down south because of the growth spurt in Southern California of the late, the late 19th and early 20th century. The reasons for that were an incredibly effective marketing and advertising campaign, which showed on postcards oranges that they, one of them fitting on a railroad car, persuaded people to come out from back east. It got to the point there was a railroad rate war between the Santa Fe Railroad and the Southern Pacific Railroad that lowered the rate for a person coming from St. Louis to Los Angeles one dollar. Mm -hmm. And that rate lasted for one day, but the rates were very, very reasonable. So thousands of people flooded into Southern California, and that answered, or that was the primary reason for that shift from Northern to Southern California as being the economic center and social center of, of the state. So we have the Port of LA and Long Beach, and the discovery of oil in the early 20th century got Long Beach on the map as well. And by 1925, oil accounted for 50% of the cargo moving out of the Port of Long Beach. Okay. So that was a tectonic shift. Okay. There were a number of ships, a number of ships, beautiful, beautiful ships, that served the West Coast during the days of sail. And one of these is the Young America. It was a beautiful clipper. She was a product of William Webb's shipyard. She was built in 1858 and sailed for many, many, many years. And she was, the New York Tribune wrote, Horace Greeley, actually personally wrote, not exceeded by anything afloat. She was one of the most beautiful ships afloat. A brush with catastrophe came in December 1868 when she was only 10 years old, when she was caught in a severe gale off the eastern coast of South America, while outbound from New York for the Golden Gate with a full load of railroad iron. Thrown on her beams and 
she became unmanageable and suffered heavy, heavy damage and only skillful stowage of the cargo, hours at the pumps by her crew, and the calm leadership of her captain, Master George Cummings, prevented disaster. According to the Daily Alta California, she arrived in San Francisco under jury rig looking like a yacht. <laughs> captain Cummings was presented with $1,000 in gold from the Board of Underwriters for his seaman-like conduct on his late voyage from New York to San Francisco. The young America faithfully labored on under American flag until 1883 when she was sold to Austrian on interest. Re renamed the Miroslav, she cleared the Delaware breakwater on February 17, 1886, outbound from Philadelphia for the Mediterranean with a cargo of 9,700 barrels of oil. She vanished and was never seen again with her entire crew. Wow. Was she a three-master? She was a three-masted clipper. You can't tell from the ship behind it. Yeah, she was a three-masted medium clipper. She wasn't a, 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 a severe clipper, and then she didn't have that clipper bow on her, that kind of cut water bow. But she was a beautiful ship, and she was lost, disappeared with her crew. Next one. Another beautiful ship. <clears throat> in 18, this, pardon me, the transatlantic steamer Vanderbilt was loaned to the U.S. Navy by Commodore Cornelius Vanderbilt for use by the U.S. Navy during the Civil War. In 1872, the Navy decided that it had no further use for the ship, and she was laid up at Mare Island, San Francisco. She was sold at auction for the sum of $42,000, and she mm -hmm. remained in ordinary for two years when the decision was made to convert her into a sailing vessel with the works supervised by Captain George Cummings of the aforementioned Young America. The ship was christened the Three Brothers and considered the pride of San Francisco. On October 24th, 1873, she was towed out to the heads of the bay to begin a maiden voyage that would take her around Cape Horn with a load of California wheat for England. The event was celebrated with much fanfare and pride in San Francisco as the Three Brothers, called the Castle of the Sea, was at 2,972 tons and 320 feet in length, the biggest ship in the world. And her cargo of 4,300 tons of California wheat, valued at almost $200,000, was the largest cargo ever carried on any ship to date. From the Daily Alta, California, quote, San Francisco may feel proud that a ship of her magnitude has been so well and thoroughly fitted up in her city that she exceeds in beauty, form, and dimensions any vessel afloat today. And more than this, it speaks well for her mechanics in every branch required for shipbuilding who have done their work so well and complete in every respect. Despite the well-deserved acclaim, the Three Brothers' uneventful career was very brief. Just six years, mostly spent in the California year of grain trade, with every outward bound trip made in no less than 100 days. It was a sad ending for the one-time castle of the sea when the Three Brothers was sold in Liverpool in 1879 and ended her days as a coal hulk for the Royal Navy in Gibraltar. The Empress of Britain, at the time, at 63,000 tons, she was the largest merchant vessel of any kind to sail the Pacific Ocean, and the biggest ever to call at the port of Los Angeles when she dropped anchor in the roadstead on March 22, 1932. With 415 <coughs> passengers aboard, she was on the last lap of her very first round the world voyage that had started in New York the previous December. The 24-knot, 760-foot-long Empress of Britain left Los Angeles two days later to pay a toll of $53,000 when she passed through the passed through the Panama Canal mm -hmm. as the largest ship to that date to ever pass through the canal. Mm -hmm. Her end came. <laughs> Her end came on October 26, 1940, when she was severely damaged by long-range German aircraft about 70 miles off the coast of Donegal, Ireland, and was soon afterwards torpedoed and sunk by the German submarine U-32. This ship was called the most attractive <laughs> ship ever to call at the port of Los Angeles when she first visited the harbor on January 13, 1932. She was the Talamanca. She was operated by the United Fruit Company. And under the command of George McBride, she docked at berth 188 in Wilmington with 100 passengers and 45,000 stems of grade 9 bananas, 19,000 of which were discharged at the company's facility right behind. 
She was one of a trio of United Fruit Company ships that linked Los Angeles and San Francisco with the Caribbean and Central, and Central America via the Panama Canal in the years leading up to World War II. American President Lyons. Unlike most of her contemporaries, the 462-foot-long C-3 type freighter, the President Grant, sported a gray hull rather than the traditional black, which her crew said was jazzy. <laughs> Sailing under the President Lyons flag, the ship and her sisters were considered the best cargo carriers in the years following World War II, linking California and Asia. In addition to 500,000 cubic feet of cargo stowage, stowage space, each ship featured 12 refrigerated areas for chilled and frozen products, including freshly caught tuna and even live goldfish. Deep tanks could handle tallow, molasses, palm oil, and other liquid cargoes. Built in San Francisco at the Western Pipe and Steel Company yard in 1945, President Grant was sold foreign in 1967, and five years later was scrapped in Taiwan. Typical of the schooners, sailing schooners that plied the California coast was the three-masted Esther Bune. Built in 1887, she logged quite a few good stories in her 40-year career. In, in November of 1909, the ship's dog was credited with saving the life of a shipwrecked sailor while the schooner was transiting Coos Bay, Oregon. Late one night, a skiff overturned, throwing four men into the water. Three of the party were drowned with the sole survivor clinging to the bottom of the overturned boat for more than half an hour before his shouts roused the Esther Bune's sleeping dog, whose barks alerted the crew to the man's plight. The Esther Bune sailed in the coastal lumber trade until she was driven aground and broke apart in heavy weather off Newport Beach in Southern California on February 13, 1927. According to local newspaper reports, several shore side cottages that still exist were built from wood debris from the wreck <laughs> that washed, washed ashore after the disaster. Mm. This is a classic case of if, uh, if you think I look bad, you should see the other guy. <laughs> um, this is the San Pedro, the 456-ton steam schooner, which served on the route from Eureka and southern ports with lumber, cargo, and passengers. The steam schooner was launched in 1899 in the work of shipbuilder John Lindstrom of Aberdeen, Washington. Lumber laden, the San Pedro collided with and sank the coastal passenger steamer Columbia on July 21st, 1907, while racing at full speed in the fog off the coast of Eureka. Seriously damaged, the steam schooner was towed to the United Engineering Works in Alameda for repairs. As for the Columbia, she went to the bottom in just 11 minutes after the collision. According to one survivor's account, the crew was at the boats cutting and slashing at the lashings and doing their utmost to launch them, while the frenzied passengers ran everywhere begging to be saved. Some knelt on the deck and said their last prayers. Men clasped their wives in their arms and mothers gathered their children about them, and they waited for the end, which they said by two, one of the survivors said, by intuition we knew was at hand. As the Columbia sank, this survivor recalled, Captain Duran urged his passengers to remain calm. Columbia carried 251 passengers and crew, 88 of whom died when she was wrecked. In addition to Captain Duran, among those lost were honeymooners George Liggett, age 25, and his 22-year-old wife of seven days, and school teacher Miss Margaret McKinney, University of California, class of 1904, who was on her way to attend a vacation in Portland, Oregon. Take a good look at these faces, because all these men are dead. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean they died natural deaths. They died in the sinking of the Helen W. Army, <clears throat> which was incredible, for the story of the ship. From the March 2nd, 1898 San Francisco call. The old island trader Helen W. Almy has been purchased by a syndicate, and will be put in the Alaska trade, Captain Hogan, formerly of the ship Wakusha, will go in command of her. Less than three weeks later, the 50-year-old, 380-ton, three-masted bark was lost. Outward bound from San Francisco for the Alaska gold fields in a raging gale, somewhere between Point Reyes and the South Carolinas. She capsized with all aboard, 40 men, her entire crew, and a group of would-be sourdough miners, all these men included, all gone. The H.W. Almy's wallowing hulk drifted for several days and mi for miles for several days, 
before she was taken in tow by a passing steamer and anchored off the cliff house at the mouth of San Francisco Bay. As newspapers from San Francisco to Sacramento to Los Angeles published fevered editorials on her fitness to sail in the first place, one of the Bay Area's most enduring mysteries took an even more inexplicable turn. Deemed beyond salvage and a hazard to navigation, a boarding party of sailors and marines from the USS Monterey was dispatched to blow up the wreck with seven heavy charges of gun cotton. The party arrived to find the ship had vanished, and a systematic search revealed only some drifting wood and a few feet of cordage in a small nearby cove that proved to be all that was left of the ill-fated ship. Well, not quite, because we'll show and tell. I was back in the day, back in the last century, when I was in high school. Um, I was the manager of a bookstore, and I came upon this book, and I, the owner of the bookstore was kind enough to just gift it to me, knowing how much I was into maritime history. This is a this is a copy of Brief and Simple Methods of Finding Latitude and Longitude. It was pre published in 1884, and it's inscribed by T.G. Cushman of San Francisco, California, of the bark H.W. Omi. It's dated July 30th, 1890, and I just wanted to bring that along, maybe show and tell, if you wanted to take a look at it. So there is something left of the H.W. Omi. Wow. <laughs> how, did it, uh, how did it get out? I don't know. Uh, I have no idea. Um, it was eight years before she was lost. So, so yeah. but haven't found anything else of her. Actually, not a photograph, nothing in any museum, nothing of her. What's the name? She was built in 1858. She was a very, very old ship, and there was a lot of a lot of controversy as to whether or not she should have sailed at all. You have to remember, the time she was lost was the time of the Yukon Gold Rush, yeah. and it was probably two or three times bigger than the California Gold Rush. Mm -hmm with just thousands of, of men piling up into Alaska, wanting to get rich, wanting to strike it rich. And there they are. Anyway, thank you. Any questions, any comments, or, yes ma'am? Uh, the bobolink, could you tell us a little bit more about the bobolink that went down here at in, Mendocino Bay in 1899? Interesting, lumber schooner. Um, I know that she looked like she was about to unload her cargo when the photograph of her was taken. Um, but her bottom was ripped out. And they were able to salvage what they could. And the left they rest, uh, the, re the left they rest. Pardon me. They did rest. I, I dyslexic. <laughs> Actually, I am dyslexic, but that's another thing I'll think of. You know, uh, you know, when life gives you melons. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, it was, it was that the Bob Link is written about in the book. There's a real, uh, it, one, I think one, uh, one crewman was lost, I believe. But what's really interesting about some of these photographs, you see the ship sitting, and it looks like they're so peaceful, and everything is so nice and quiet. But the violence that, 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 that's, that put them in their lot, and in their situation, and cost, uh, sometimes one, sometimes 10, sometimes 20 or 30 people their lives. It's really disconcerting. It's, it's kind of off-putting, kind of odd. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, do you consider any disaster a shipwreck, given a, tor a torpedo? Oh, certainly. Oh, sure, the Absaroka. So any ship that is Sure, at the Absaroka, the uh, Amidio. Uh, I'm trying to think of a couple of other ones. The, the Absaroka was torpedoed. Um, Christmas Eve of 1941, off of uh, Point Furman, and uh, I think two crewmen lost their lives, and they were able to ground her quickly. She would have gone down. She was operating for uh, Pope and Talbot, which is a lumber carrier. It was on her way into into San Pedro when she was torpedoed. Can you make a rough idea of, of the causes? Is it 50 percent weather and 20 percent ship design and 20 percent? You know, is there depends on the time. The, the earliest. The earliest real comment we have that I was able to uncover about conditions along the coastline came from very, very old Spanish um, uh, accounts. The earliest shipwreck we account we have is the Trinidad, which I believe was in 1540, and no one knows what the cause was. I would say probably, as a rough estimate, probably 60 
to 70% were weather conditions, and the remainder was bad navigation, poor charts, ego, um, you know, stupidity. One, one of the funniest, you know, and I, I say funny because no one was lost in the wreck, was the May Flint in 1900, on September 8th of 1900, a whole bunch of ships were gathered in San Francisco Bay to celebrate the following day was going to be the 50th anniversary of the statehood of California, which became a state on September 9th of 1850. So the Navy ships was there, the USS Iowa, which was a round battleship, was there. Incredible. You know, the ships were lit and they were... <laughs> That's really weird. I'll tell you after I'm done, I'm going to tell you a story. About it. Very, very weird. Um, and all these ships were gathered and they were covered with lights and everything. And there were thousands of people on tugboats and they were weaving their way between the fleet of ships and looking at all the ships. It was just wonderful. Well, in steams this four masted bark called the May Flint. Now, <laughs> the, the captain, number one, wanted to make a show. And number two, wanted to avoid a tow issue. He came through the Golden Gate without a, without a, a pilot or a tugboat. Stupid and stupid, okay? Don't do that. He came in, lost contrary currents and whatnot, lost control of, of the vessel, of the ship. It's a four-masted bark now. It went out of control, became unmanageable, and impaled itself on the bow of the USS Iowa, on the ram bow of the USS Iowa. And it was impaled there with all these floodlights and people pointing <laughs> and everything in, you know, great California. So it's, it's impaled, and she finally floated off, careened off of another ship, turned turtle and sank. And her, she's still at the bottom of San Francisco Bay. This is a four-masted bark now. It's not a small ship. The captain obviously lost his job, and he was on the beach for two years before they put him back in command of the two-masted motor schooner. So, and he kind of disappeared. I couldn't research. I didn't find anything after after that. Mm -hmm. so, yes, um, the CSA uh, Shenandoah. Did you ever see anything about it being here on the coast during the Civil War? Along the coast, no. I do know that there was a that there was a, a plot um, amongst. There, there was a huge community in California that was pro-Confederacy. Uh, our next little town down. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> but in San Francisco, what happened is a bunch of gentlemen called the Knights of the Golden Circle, who were supporters of the of, of the Confederacy, yeah. chartered, or actually kind of, I not really chartered. They bought a schooner, and outfitted it, and were going to sail it to the Channel Islands, namely San Miguel Island, where they were going to set up a depot of arms and whatnot and ply on the gold ships that were coming from Pan between San Francisco and Panama. Right. Well, what happened is that one of the guys told the government and in swoop, U.S. Marshals, San Francisco police, U.S. Marines, U.S. sailors, everybody but the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, <laughs> they come in and they arrest these guys and it, it turned into a trial that was on the front page of, of the papers in Daily Alta, California for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks after that. All of the perpetrators, except for the guy who, you know, ratted. ratted. <laughs> we have a rebel in our They got 10 years at Alcatraz. But they were released, Abraham Lincoln paroled and released them after I think they were there a year. And that's when Alcatraz was not so much a prison as it was an artillery fortress built to protect the bay from the Shenandoah right. and other, uh, which I don't even think got close. Uh, I don't think. She, she sank a lot of merchant ships, you know, US flag, pr primarily whalers. She sank a number of whalers. On the west coast. On the west coast, oh, well, yeah. well, in the Pacific. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Do you have any highlights of the CA Thayer? Some of the high points of the life of the Thayer? Well, she was beached a couple of times. I know that. She was grounded and she was actually off of, uh, I think it was in Coos Bay in 1906 and they almost gave her up for loss, but they towed her off. And she, a lot, does everyone know who Carl Cordham was? Carl Cordham was, the, the guy really was, was, he was, he was 
the man who, who founded the San Francisco Maritime Museum. If it wasn't for him, the Balclutha, the Kailani, the Wapama, the C.A. Thayer, the Alma, the Hercules, they wouldn't be there. And he was the one who almost single-handedly led, led the effort to restore these, these mm -hmm. older ships. Unfortunately, the C.A. Well, unfortunately, the Wapama is gone now. Unfortunately, she just was allowed to crumble to nothing. Uh, they put her out. They took her out of the water and put her on a barge, but she was beyond re restoring. The C.A. Thayer has been almost completely restored, I think, twice. But very, very famous lumber schooner, and was I think it was built in the late 1880s up in Washington. I think at the Lindstrom Yard in Aberdeen. And uh, a beautiful, if you ever get down to San Francisco, you can go aboard it. It's a beautiful, beautiful schooner. Yes, sir? I read uh, some evidence that there was a visit of Chinese ships in uh, Mexico mm -hmm. a few years after the uh, Spanish took it over in mm -hmm. the 1520s. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you have seen any evidence of Chinese visits here between then and about 1850s when the frolic came in. The only evidence I saw, and it's some people, some maritime archaeologists question the authenticity of it, were the, were the, the circular anchors found off the coast of Southern California that, 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 that resemble Chinese coins uh, of the 15th and 16th centuries. Um, they have a hole in the middle and they surmise, because of the wear on these, that these were used actually for anchors. But other than that, I don't know. I don't think so. Have you ever talked to Thomas Layton? I know the name. I know the name. Layton yeah. was the discoverer of the frolic. Here. Yeah, the frolic down in Santa Barbara. She was sure in Santa Barbara. Right here. At Cabrillo, the oh, frolic went aboard at ground here at okay. Cabrillo. Yeah. That's why we're here. She'd been in... Oh, <laughs> oh well, thank you. <laughs> You're not why I'm here. How about that? Yeah, that's right here. Like that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and she was a, uh, an opium clipper, right? She mm, yeah. was an opium clipper. Yeah. And um, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of dark side. There was a um, a really really sad story. The city of Chester uh, was a, a coastal steamer that was rammed by um, the Oceanic, which was a White Star Line ship that was. Uh, the the, Brit the same company that owned the Titanic, actually in the Olympic, they were they had three ships that were, were involved in um, the route linking San Francisco with Yokohama and, and Hong Kong. They did this this triangular type of route. In the fog again, the um, the Oceanic smashed into the city of Chester, and the city of Chester started went over on their starboard side, and people were falling off the ship and whatnot, and it. Uh, Several of the crewmen, one in particular, jumped off of the Oceanic and saved passengers of the city of Chester. And there was one who was 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 noted uh, and honored afterwards for saving the life of a two-year-old boy who was drowning. The boy was floating around in the debris, and this fellow, a steward, jumped off, and, w and this is a long jump into debris-filled water to save the life of the boy. The thing was, the fellow who did it was Chinese. His name was Al Lang. And in the San Francisco call, it's, it's really quite something that um, they said, you know, we don't think you highly have the Chinese, and uh, we'll let, just lay it on the line. But what this guy did is, was really heroic, and honor to whom honor is due. And that was at a time when there were anti-Chinese laws, there were exclusionary laws barring Chinese from coming into California, from coming into the United States, or at least limiting their numbers. At a time when, when they were looked at as, as almost subhuman. So there are a lot of stories like that. I came across in going online and in libraries uh, to different sources that really hadn't been gone to before, and I was able to find some things that really kind of needed to be corrected. One was, for years and years and years, a particular ship was thought to have sunk off of Long Beach, California. Truth be told, she was sunk off of Long Beach, Long Island <laughs> two years later. <laughs> so, but... The, you know, a lot of the sources that I went to were written at a time when the internet didn't exist, when a lot of the books hadn't been written that, that exist now. So I'm really the, whatever I've written has been the beneficiary of a lot of stuff that's come to, that's come to, uh, to light only really within the last five to ten years. Yes, sir? In your book, do you tell the story of that group of uh, naval uh, warships that went aground off of, uh, I think it was Guadalupe? Honda. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> fascinating. Find anything new about yeah. It? Find out anything new? Yeah. Other than how stupid it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, on that day, September eighth of nineteen twenty-three, eight ships were lost at the same place. Seven of them were U.S. Navy destroyers. Early in the day, the, the steamship Cuba was headed down the coast and went onto a reef um, off of near, well, actually off Point Reyes. And um, one has to remember, whenever you're doing historical research or historical study, you have to remember context. You can't put 2014 values or ideals or technological advances or whatnot on what was happening 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Back then, there was no such thing as satellite navigation. There was no such thing as, uh, you know, what we have today, radar. It didn't exist. Even, even wireless. There were still some ships after World War I that were sailing without radios. Okay. The Cuba goes aground. There's a huge amount of radio traffic. Chatter back and forth. Ah, ah, ah. No, we're sinking, blah, blah, blah. At the same time that Cuba sank, miles down the coast off of Lompoc, which is now part of Vandenberg Air Force Base, Point Honda, it's also known as Pernalas, or the Devil's Jaws. Seven ships, part of a squadron of U.S. Navy destroyers, these are four staff destroyers, none of which were, were older than four years old. These are almost brand new ships. Headed down the coast, they're headed from Mare Island, to Southern California for gunnery exercises. They're also going on a trial speed run. Hmm. They were headed in line, right, the squadron of ships, there were 11 ships total. Remember, there's no radar, there's no radio direction finding, there's no satellite navigation, there's no, G no GPS, there's charts and what you can tell, okay, by looking in this part, the port. He took an early port turn thinking he was going into the Santa Barbara Channel because the coastline was covered in fog. Mm -hmm. A little too early. <laughs> he led his ship, and he led his ship, the USS Delphi, right under the rocks. The other ships followed suit. <laughs> um, all of them, just boom, 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 seven of them, okay? <clears throat> what happened was there was a lot of confusion afterwards, and the thinking is now a couple of things came into play that all the radio chatter and radio traffic dealing with, this, with the rescue of the Cuba got in the way of the radio traffic coming from the Navy ship saying we're in big trouble here. Another thing is, the week before all these ships went aground and were lost, there was the great Kanto, Kanto earthquake in Tokyo, Japan. Worst earthquake ever to hit Japan. It was huge. It caused a tsunami that crossed the Pacific and many people think it disrupted the currents along the Pacific coast. So it was a combination of fog, dead reckoning, which didn't pay off, and currents that they weren't used to that drove the ships onto, onto the coast. But they're still there. The wrecks are still there. I read some time ago that it was in the 80s or 90s, uh, a, a scuba diver um, found a, a, a Naval Academy ring of one of the officers. Oh, sure. Yeah. And, uh, did the research and found out where the family was and was sent back to Yeah, 28 sailors died. Mm -hmm. it was, it, to this day, it's the largest loss of ships the peacetime U.S. Navy has ever had. Seven destroyers in a matter of 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Did they change their um, um, operation? and not follow each other so closely? <laughs> <laughs> well, having been in the military... Uh, no. Out, yeah, they did. They did. They did. It was um, it's a horrific mess. I remember reading in one of the, in one of the uh, episodes, or one of the accounts, it, it, the fellow said, because these are very, rather high cliffs, and to rescue the sailors, they had to rig up um, lines, like breaches boys. Right, to pull one man at a time off of the ship. And the fellow said, the ships looked as if, looked like toys that had been tossed around by a petulant child. Is there some, like this, bow sticking up in the air, overturned, they looked like toys. And these were, you know, 310 foot long destroyers. And they're still there. They're still there. Low tide, you can still see some of the engines sticking up. There's a famous photograph of about six of them, half 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 The Navy has a whole battery of pictures I, I was able to see of aerial shots. And they've identified which one is which. And they've actually they actually named one of the islands after one of the ships. I think it's the Hull Hull Island. It was impaled on it and then she went over and that was it. Yeah. But what's surprising is only you know, I hesitate to say only twenty eight men were lost. Which is a significant number. But they were all caught in the engine room of one of the ships that turned turtle almost immediately, and that's a hopeless situation. So, yes, yes, sir. You were uh, mentioned the Malthusa. Uh, I don't know whether she'd been abandoned and let to go to pot or what, but uh, she'd been sitting off of the uh, uh, Martinez yeah. for a while before the Maritime yeah. Museum took yeah. over. They've done incredible work. It's a beautiful ship. Mm -hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, Monday morning I will be speaking on her, the murder of So I've been told. So, um, but yeah, she's, she was a part of the, everyone know what the Alaska Packers fleet? Ever hear of Alaska? Alaska Packers fleet, it was based in San Francisco but operated out of Seattle. Um, it was a group of businessmen in San Francisco got together and bought 19 sailing, British, what were formerly British flag, mainly British flag, sailing ships. And this is when sailing ships, steam was coming in, and sailing ships were on their decline, and they were fading away. Well, they got these ships were dirt cheap, and they operated them in the salmon trade. Once a year, early in the year, they take um, fishermen, cannery equipment, cannery supplies, provisions, and, and cannery workers up to Alaska and then in the later part of the summer, they get the catch from Alaska and bring it back down to Seattle to be, to be processed and canned. They bring the canned stuff down and, and or to be processed. They'd either, let me rephrase, they would bring either canned stuff from Alaska down or fresh salmon down that had been caught to be canned in Seattle. In the off season, they would lay the ships up in the Oakland estuary. They'd just stack them up like the reserve fleet is. You know, in the bay in San Francisco. And they, they just leave them there. Well, that's where they found the Star of Scotland, which was her name. She was built as the Belkuta, went through a couple of name changes, became the Star of Scotland. All of the Alaska Packers fleet ships were Star of, Star of Chile, Star of Peru, Star of Japan, whatever. And they reverted her back, but she still has that long quarter deck that they fitted her out with when she went to work for the start of, uh, for the uh, Alaska Packers. She would have had a shorter quarter deck as a Valkyrie had they left her the same. Carl Corden is behind that. He was behind her, her finding the founder, and he was behind uh, her restoration back in the 60s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Thank you. I toured it, and it's set up really nicely. Oh, it's beautiful. And, you, and they have like the little audio yeah. things, and then like bales and things you can sit on. Yeah, it's really beautiful. And Cal California really has a lot going for it in terms of maritime heritage. And uh, I was up in Eureka about four weeks ago, and they have a nice little museum here in Samoa, uh, along with a great restaurant. If anybody's ever been to Samoa Cookout, <laughs> great. I could live on the second floor of the Samoa. <laughs> Fantastic. But um, uh, they have a little museum there, and. Uh, they have the Star of India, which was also an Alaska Packers ship in San Diego, which is the, the oldest ship. She was built in 1863 as the Utrepe, and they sail her. She's the oldest ship in the world still sailing under sail. They take her out under sail two or three times a year. Beautiful. She's a three-masted She's She's a three bark. 1863, she was built in, um, I think, either Scotland or the Isle of Man, I don't recall which, as the Utrepe. But they, they still, the USS Constitution is still commissioned, isn't it? And it's uh, taken out every year or two to move it around. And well, they move it around, they don't sail her. Yeah. yeah. They don't sail the Constitution. They don't sail, yeah, the Constitution or the Constellation. They don't actually sail them. They tow them out and kind of, like you turn a piece of meat in an oven. You can't, you just kind of flip it over. <laughs> but the Utrecht, they actually take around, or the start of any, they actually take around and sail her in San Diego. They have a crew that they train and whatnot. And she's under sail, absolutely beautiful. I, I've been in a helicopter and seen her under sail. It's a breathtaking sight. It's, you know, you don't see that anymore. You just don't see that anymore. Yes, ma'am. The Star of India, what was the 
basic, um, uh, what was she working? She was built for the jute trade. Between, jute? Jute, between, <laughs> Eng between England and India, originally back in the 1860s. And then she uh, went into the transatlantic transatlantic trade between England and North England and Northern Europe and North America, primarily New York. And then she wound up on the Pacific Coast. Uh, well, actually, if I remember correctly, she she wound up in the Falkland Islands as a barge or something like that. And they discovered her down there and brought her up to California and started to work on her. But she, she laid fallow for many, many years <laughs> until they could raise the money there. I think a little old lady and her husband lived aboard her and, and you know, took care of her. We're kind of caretakers until the, the San Diego Military Museum took care of her. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you. A beautiful ship. It's really quite beautiful. You go down, you, you, go, you go below decks into some of these ships and you think you're in a, a, a hotel. You know, just the, the woodwork and the, the care that was taken by the, by the men who built these things. And she's an iron ship. You know, she's iron, she's not steel. And she's lasted for 100 and, uh, 150 years. Beautiful show. If you're ever in San Diego, she's right on the waterfront. Mm -hmm. yeah. With the Berkeley. They have the Ferry Berkeley there too. Yeah. The museum is the museum is actually on the Berkeley. They have a very nice museum. Anyone else? Anything at all? Yes? What? <laughs> So as the I got to number one, anyway. <laughs> yes. Shall I start uh, with <laughs> I'm just interested, it seems like a daunting research project to find all the shipwrecks on California coasts. And you said you spent an hour, a year and a half yeah. researching your book. So yeah. what are some of the, uh, what was your research process and what are some of the places that you had to go to find the information and what are some of the obstacles that you found in trying to put together a comprehensive list of shipwrecks. Well, well, first off, not all 2,000 wrecks are, are, are in the book. A, a lot of them, several hundred of them, about four or five hundred of them are. There are many that I, I was limited by the, by the publisher <laughs> as to how much. Okay. But, um, wow, that's a multi multi-dimensional question and I don't want to answer it. Are there any other? <laughs> <laughs> I was, when I was in the Coast Guard, <clears throat> I'd taken a couple of journalism classes before I went in the Coast Guard and I was, I was what was called, I don't even know if they have it anymore, a, an SNQC, a QM. I was a seaman striking to be a quartermaster, okay, which is like working navigation and steer the cutter. They found out I'd taken a couple of classes in journalism and they turned me into a journalist. <laughs> okay, I did not want to do I wanted to be a quartermaster. But anyway, that's what I did. I got out of the service. The first job I found was as a reporter for the old LA Daily Commercial News, which was founded in 1905 and they reported on the goings on at the port, air cargo, railroads, that sort of thing. So I got into transportation. But I, I, my, my first love was maritime, was ships. So I learned as a reporter to apply a reporter's approach towards this type of thing, the who, what, when, where, why, and how, with more of an emphasis on the who, because I, I thought a lot's been written. I mean, there, there are people who are much, much more in tune than I. James Delgado in the past, James Gibbs, uh, Gordon Newell, all these different writers have written about California maritime history, or the history of the Pacific Coast, maritime history of the Pacific Coast. <clears throat> I wanted to look at it, I wanted to take another approach to it. So what I did was, I applied that ages old axiom that I've always found to be good, let the research speak for itself. Okay, I didn't want to write in, into anything, I wanted to see what people at the time were writing about these different topics. I came upon a couple of websites that were absolutely crucial to my research. Places like the Kelly House, places like um, the Humboldt County Historical Society, the Redondo Beach Historical Society, the old files of the Torrance Daily Breeze, uh, the old files of the San Francisco called the Daily Alta California, these old newspapers and whatnot, some of which I had to go by, through by hand, others available online. Um, I found, frankly, personally, I have more fun 
I enjoy the research more than I actually do the writing. The research took about a year and a half, the writing took about six months because it wasn't that difficult. I let the research, I let the people of the time speak for themselves. That's what I wanted to do, that's what I still want to do in this new work that I'm working on now because I'm not writing it as much as I'm editing it and compiling it and editing it and allowing those people who wrote when they, they were there. They know a lot more about it than I do. If I find something that conflicts, I'll track that down and correct it. Number of people lost in Iraq. Uh, the actual names of, of some vessels at times. The SS Lewis it was a famous steamship that was lost in 1854, 1855. And do you look under Samuel Les Lewis or SS Lewis? Because if you look under SS Lewis, you're probably not going to find anything. But it's known today as the SS Lewis. Then, it was the Samuel S. S. Uh, the Samuel S. Lewis. Uh, Lewis. The reason is you put SS in front of the name today, it means steamship. It didn't mean that then, in those days. The term wrecker has a different connotation then than it has now. A wrecker then was a person who salvaged ships after they were wrecked. We think of a wrecker today as, you know, a grizzled guy who put up a lamp on the shoreline in the middle of the night to lure a ship onto the shore so we could go kill the crew and pillage in the whole night. <laughs> totally different. So there's that kind of thing. There's that kind of mm. that that context that I had to maintain as well. But um, it's just application of basic journalism, which unfortunately we don't see a lot today. So this man. I'm sorry. Yes. Was there any um, particular rep that struck you that you came upon that? is not well known that had a, a particularly interesting story to it? More than one, sure, but... Oh, I don't know that I can say one. Um, the Harvard was interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, I did a lot of research on the Harvard. The Harvard was a coastal steamer that was wrecked off, to, off of Point Arguello. And one of the interesting things about her is on her stack she had court ship two chevrons, and she was awarded those chevrons for her service in World War I ferrying the troops from England to France. And she wore those on her, on her uh, stack to the, the day she went under the water. She sounded her distress alarm on a steam whistle that it was recovered from the Santa Rosa, which had sunk 10 years before at Point Arguello. Mm -hmm. They got the steam whistle, put it on the harbor, the harbor Mm -hmm. oh, the same place. Wow. There, are, there are also cases of um, three schooners called named the Ella Florence, all being lost at the same place, wow. like years apart. That is very, very strange. When that when that thing went off, it reminded me I was I, when I and this I'm not I'm not a believer in spiritualist stuff. Okay. Like, have to look out here, and you'll be in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long drive back to <laughs> um, I was writing about a, uh, actually it was the Walla Walla, which was a steamer, a uh, very, very famous steamer, and, and loved, well loved the, the people who sailed on her from actually between the Bay Area and LA, and she came up to this part of the coast sometimes as well. Gentleman on board had been with the company, had been with the Pacific Steam Navigation Company for 22 years, 25 years. His name was John Connell, and he lived with his three sisters in Oakland. And I read, it was very poignant reading how his three sisters were eagerly awaiting his, you know, news on his return. And as I was typing this, I'm not kidding, this really happened. I have a plaque over my desk, right? The plaque came off. The uh -huh. Came off the bookcase and landed on the computer, mm. on the keyboard. No, no. no. <laughs> it was very strange. As I was writing about John Connell, the thing came off and landed on the, on the keyboard. Yeah. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it means anything. It was weird. <laughs> but he, he was never found. He was not one of the survivors. Lord only knows how long the sisters waited. They, they, so they walk back and forth on their widow's walks? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, are there any widow's walks in Oakland? <laughs> I don't know. Back in those days. Yeah. Well, there, there are in my, my parents' neck of the world. Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. 
go out for a, a two-year whaling voyage and never be seen again. Are there any other? I'm, I'm here for another 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs>